invite you to open your Bibles with me today to the Gospel of Mark. We are uh, slowly but steadily making our way through this Gospel. We are in Mark chapter 1 today, and we'll be looking at verses 29 through 34. The next little scene here, a very uh, important scene as we continue to consider uh, Jesus the Son. If you've located Mark chapter 1, I'd like to read our text as you follow along, verses 29 through 34, and then we will begin our our study together. Scripture says, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak, because they knew who he was. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have been born again, not through a perishable seed, but that which is imperishable, the living and enduring word of God. And so we pray that the seed of your word will find good soil in our hearts today, that it would indeed sprout up and produce fruit. For some, may that be life eternal for the first time, And for your children, may that be life abundant as we continue to rejoice in your word. Teach us, Lord, that you might be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's been said before that we don't value our health until sickness shows up. Isn't that pretty true? Whether it's something small like a toothache, or a headache, or a sprained ankle, or something big like knee replacement, or leukemia. Sickness gives us a new appreciation for health. Health plays a big role in our day-to-day lives, maybe even a bigger role than sometimes we think about or are aware of. Much of our schedules, much of our daily activities, much of what we do is dictated by our health. You ever caught yourself saying, I can't eat pizza this late, I'll get heartburn. Or caught yourself, why did they print these, why did they print this so small, you know? I'm curious if, you'll, if, you, if you don't mind admitting to it, how many of you on a regular basis, daily, weekly, whatever it is, take some kind of supplement, vitamin, or prescribed medicine? Raise your hand. Yeah. So health plays a big role in our day-to-day lives. And we put a lot of energy and time and money and a lot of thought into our health. Now, there are some Christians, some people who I suspect who, who maybe feel a little bit conflicted about this, as if it's, it's somewhat of a waste. It seems to be that there's, there's some who, who tend to think that, that deep down, that what really, really matters is the soul, the whole soul, and nothing but the soul. And they wonder if these bodies are just going to become worm food, why would we put so much effort into them? There are some who seem to even think that, well, after we die, we're just going to be disembodied spirits floating on a cloud in an eternal choir practice for, for, for end, end of days. C.S. Lewis had a few thoughts on this subject. Lewis said, there are some people who seem to think that the body and pleasure and physical things are crude and irreligious. Lewis said, There's no good in trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant for you and me to be merely spiritual creatures. He likes matter. In fact, Lewis added, he invented it. That includes our bodies. 
In fact, after, right after he made the male and female body, God sat back and looked and said, well, now that is very good. By the way, if you want a really good resource on this topic, I'm in the middle of reading a book that just came out. It's an excellent treatment of the topic by Nancy Piercy. It's entitled Love Thy Body. Now, the title sounds provocative, but her point in the book writing as a Christian is that the human body is part of God's good creation and that as such, every human body has dignity and meaning and purpose. And she very eloquently argues that if we're going to talk to our world and our culture about issues such as sexuality and gender and life and death and abortion and euthanasia, then we need to have a very clear, robust biblical theology, not just of the soul, but also of the body. Now, don't misunderstand me this morning. God is eternally interested in your soul. But He is not only interested in your soul. He is also greatly interested in our bodies. And that idea is front and center in our passage today in Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. If you were here last week, you know that we just saw Jesus in the synagogue in Capernaum where He there performed an exorcism. And through that exorcism, with Jesus casting out this demon, we saw there that, that, that the supernatural world is under Jesus' authority. Now as we come to the next scene, we discover that not only is the supernatural world under His authority, but also the natural world is under His authority. That the same son who casts out the demons is also the son who heals the diseased. And Mark includes this, the, these two little samplings, these two little stories to remind us of just the unrivaled, unparalleled power of our Savior. I have no doubt that there's some of you sitting here this morning that in your body you have aches and pains. Some of you have sicknesses. Some that you've not even told someone about. And I would encourage you to listen closely to what we learn about our Savior, especially in our sickness. And others of us, you, you know somebody who is sick and you're thinking, I don't know what to do for them. I'm not even sure how to think about this. I'm not even sure if I should pray for them. I mean, do, how, how do I approach this? Well, Mark is going to show us and guide us and teach us both about our bodies and our souls. In Mark 1, 29 to 34, we have these two little events. There's a scene in the first three verses, and there's another scene in the next three verses. And these two healing events teach us about ourselves and about our Savior. Let me summarize the first section here and what we learn and then we'll study those verses together. In verses 29 to 31, here we are reminded that no pain or person is too small for the son's tender care. No pain and no person is too small for the son's tender care. Where do I get that idea? Notice how Mark begins this section here, verse 29. It says, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue. So Jesus has just finished this, this, this time in the synagogue. If you remember, He showed up to teach. But while He was teaching, He was interrupted by this demon-possessed man. So He casts out the demon in this very dramatic display of His power. And then this, presumably he, he finishes up His teaching. And the crowd is left just, just amazed and astonished at what this man is saying and what he is doing. And so Mark tells us that once synagogue was over, they immediately made their way to somewhere. He says in verse 29, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now the way Mark describes this, the house appears to both be the house of Simon and Andrew. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon for extended families to live together. 
Today, it's odd to see more than one generation typically under one roof. Some of you, you have, you know, your, your kids are 20, 21, and you're thinking, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, right? That's what we do. We, we kind of split up the generations. But in the first century, it was not uncommon to have three or four generations, grandparents and nieces and nephews and uncles and cousins, everybody on one kind of compound living in one home. And likewise, this is called the home of Simon and Andrew. They lived there with their wives, their families, and with the extended family. By the way, just a side note, I mentioned last week the Capernaum Synagogue. If you ever go to Israel on a trip, you can see the Capernaum of Synagogue. You can see some of the stones. They've uncovered it. And if you walk just a few yards away, there's actually a house that some say this is this actual house. It's uncovered and there's inscriptions in the walls where it was a place of early Christian gathering and given its proximity, there are some historians and some tradition that says this is the actual home of Peter and Andrew. But nevertheless, they came to this house that was clearly nearby and they bring with them James and John. So you have Jesus, notice this, and four disciples. You you have this small group, this very private gathering, And they're going to go behind closed doors for what's about to take place. Verse 30 says, And now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. Now we've already learned that Simon was a fisher man. Now we learn he is a married man. By the way, just as a side note, this would be fun uh, lunchtime trivia. Did you know that Simon Peter's wife is actually mentioned at another place in the Bible? It's really obscure. It's in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul's making this random point, and he says, and it's like Peter, whose wife went along, went with him on the mission trips, or something like that. And he appeals to the fact that his wife was a partner with him as he went along with the work that they were doing. So his wife was apparently became a believer and was a partner in the work. But here they come to his his wife's mother, Simon's mother-in-law here is, notice, sick with fever. A few months, uh, a few weeks ago, my daughter started running a fever. And, uh, you know, we, she, she had this fever. My wife said she feels warm, and so we tested her temperature. It was like 101, 102. And, uh, but it continued for a day, two, three days. But she had no other symptoms. She wasn't like, she was eating fine, sleeping fine. So we're sitting there thinking, do we go to the doctor? Do we not go to the doctor? What is this? And we're kind of, you'd think after six kids we would know what we were doing. But it's, we, we, we're still figuring out. So we, we just thought about it and like three days, got to four days and was like, why does she still have this fever? So finally, another church member commented and said, isn't she six? And my wife said, yeah. She goes, maybe she's cutting her molars. And lo and behold, she opened her mouth, looked in, there's two brand new teeth popping out. Now, little kids and grown-ups, we get fevers. Why? Because there's something wrong. In fact, when we we hear that so-and-so has a fever, somebody Wednesday night, right before church, they said, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so. She's got a fever of 102. And my first thought was, what's wrong? Right? Because to us, a fever is a symptom. But the way he describes it here in this era, the fever is the disease. It's sort of how they saw it. She was lying sick with what? With a fever. In fact, Dr. Luke in his gospel says it was a mega fever. It was a, it was a big, it was a high fever that had gripped her. So we don't know the specifics as to really what this was, but they knew that something was wrong because she had such a severe fever. And it says in verse 30, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Now, we don't know, again, the details here. We have to use our sanctified imaginations. But you can just imagine having seen what they just saw with Jesus in the synagogue, him casting out this demon in this very public and dramatic way. You can imagine Simon and Andrew walking home going, wow, I wonder what else he can do. They, they, they make their way home, and so they start talking, and they say, hey, Jesus. Now, maybe it was that, or maybe it was just him saying, hey, when we go home, lunch is on us. We've got to make our own, because my mother-in-law, she's sick with a fever. She's not there to do the sort of domestic duties. Regardless, they're making their way, and they, they, they bring up this issue that the, his mother-in-law is, is sick. And so verse 31 says, and he came to her, 
that's Jesus, and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. Notice what happens here, just like in the synagogue with the exorcism. Jesus does not use some long incantation. There's no special potions or he doesn't quote the Old Testament. He doesn't even have to pray. It says he just raises her up and the fever left her. And he healed her. In fact, notice that it says that the fever left her and then immediately it says what in verse 31? She waited on them. Now, that's not there because, well, she's a woman and her job is to to serve everybody, you know, kind of thing. The words there is actually deacon. She deaconed them. She served them. And it typically means food. So, So one minute she's lying in the bed sick, and the next moment she's in the kitchen making falafels and hummus or whatever, whatever it was. Now, I don't know about you, but you ever had a you ever been sick for an extended period of time? And when the fever goes away and you start to feel better and you go back to work and you're there for an hour and you go, oh, I can't do this yet. Right? Like you you haven't even recovered from the recovery. You just, you need another day to get back to strength. The way Mark describes this, the emphasis here is, well, not because she's a woman, she went to the kitchen. The way Mark describes this, no, the healing was so immediate and so complete that without any delay, any hesitation, she could instantly resume her normal activities. She didn't need an extra day in the bed to get her strength. There was no weeks of rehab, no restricted diet, no limit to her activity. Immediately, Jesus heals her in such a way that she had full strength, full health, and full vitality. And so Jesus heals her, and she waited on them. Now, that's the essence of this little story. But I think the picture here is something not just of healing, but something else. Did you notice the little phrase that Mark throws in in verse 31? He came to her and raised her up, what? Taking her by the hand. Now, there is so much crammed culturally, theologically, scripturally into that little phrase. Taking her by the hand. First off, if you remember our study last year of the book of Leviticus, what did we learn in Leviticus about sick people? They're unclean. You do not touch a sick person. Because not only are you at risk of getting their germs biologically, but you are at risk, not even at risk, you will most definitely become unclean ceremonially. That's why she couldn't go to synagogue. Because she's, she's got this fever, she's sick. And so they were not allowed to touch her. And to touch us, the person, the uncleanness transferred, not necessarily the germs, although it may be the case, but, but the uncleanness transferred, and you were not supposed to touch. In fact, they would often have to go outside the city walls and tell people they were unclean because of their sickness. And yet here we find Jesus coming And he does not become unclean by touching her. If anything, he makes her immediately clean. But not only that, I think even on a purely sort of human level, human touch is one of the most incredible, personal, and meaningful things that we do. Right now I'm doing marital counseling with, uh, premarital counseling with a bunch of couples, and I've been reading different books and was reminded, I was thinking this week, that, 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 you know, marriage books will often tell you, if you find that your marriage, if you find it's kind of lost its spark and it's gotten dull and you want to recapture some of that magic, they say one of the first things to do, to ask is, are you touching each other? Like, are you holding hands? Did you put your arm around her like you used to? Did, do you put a hand on her knee? Because there's something that, that's communicated, right? It's nonverbal communication, but it speaks louder than even what words can do. If your kid falls off the bike or they lose a game and they come over crying, you can give them a pep talk, but sometimes as a parent, the best thing to do is what? Just, just give them a hug. That touch, that embrace, it, it communicates something deeply. And likewise here, I think Jesus here, by the skin-to-skin contact with this physical connection, He is communicating to her something that words cannot even express. 
See, this story not only teaches us that Jesus cures, but that Jesus cares. This is not just power. This is power coupled with compassion. Here we see the tenderness of Jesus, the thoughtfulness of Jesus, the sympathy of Jesus, the personal touch of Jesus that he comes to her. Notice, he's not even just interested in healing the crowds to make his name great. He cares about this one individual behind closed doors. And not just an individual, but a woman who would have been marginalized by, the, by many people in her society. She was physically sick. That has a strike against her. She was ceremonially unclean. That's a strike against her. Culturally, she was a woman. And in that sense, often seen as property and sort of devalued as less important. She had that against her. And yet Jesus comes and cares for her. In fact, if you think about it in a very literal sense, here is Jesus visiting the shut-ins. It's easy when people are out of sight for them to be out of mind. That's one thing in our prayer sheet that we have each week, and even our, our director we're about to print, we, we designate SI, those who are shut-ins, because they are members of the body who physically can't be here, and Jesus comes and shows her value. That he not only cured the disease, but he cared for her. Someone that others may have overlooked, someone that others may have have ignored, yet Jesus comes and shows her such attention. If you think about it, many times the outcasts of our society are the VIPs in Jesus' kingdom. While some in our culture want to kill and to get rid of the unborn, it's Jesus who says, then bring the little children to me. While others would look at the the widows and the the elderly and sort of just place them somewhere to get them out of sight and out of mind, Jesus says, I tell you, this widow, and who gave such small amounts, she gave more than all of you put together. In all of this, we see the tender care, the compassion of Jesus, that no disease, no pain is too small, and no person is too small. Most small children, not all of them, but many have a a toy that's special to them. All six of my kids have. Oftentimes it's a stuffed animal or a doll or some toy. Growing up in my family, we called them pets. My mom would say, get your pet. My wife had a different word for them. She called them lovies. It's just that thing that, you know, that child loves dearly. All my kids have them, but my son Josiah, he loves giraffes. He has this little yellow giraffe. He calls him Raffy. And he, that thing looks terrible, all right? His neck has been stretched out. He's as flat as a pancake, practically. All the stuffing's gone in it. It's dirty. He's chewed on the ear. You know, it's just gnarly-looking little toy. And, and if it was lying anywhere, if you just saw it about, you would think, looking at it, that thing is just, it's worthless. It's garbage. Like, it just needs to be, it's got holes, it's been sewn. It's just, that, that, that's no good but not to him. It is priceless. My friends, that's how Jesus sees Simon's mother-in-law. And that's how Jesus sees us even in our sickness, even in our agony, even in our pain, when we feel alone, when we feel worthless, when we may feel useless and unproductive, Jesus sees and he cares. Maybe you feel unlovable to your parents or to your spouse or unlovable to those around you. Listen, I don't know what's going on in your life and chances are, yes, you may be a mess, but you are deeply loved by Jesus. I can't prove it, but I wonder if Peter had this in mind when he wrote his letter because in 1 Peter 5, he tells Christians everywhere, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. He cares for you in a way that nobody else can or does. And no pain is too small, no person's too small for that care. Now, does this mean that God can remove our sickness and heal us in an instant? The answer is yes. He most definitely can. Do you remember Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2? Paul says he was sick to the point of death. And then he says a phrase, and if you're ever curious, this is how I pray for the sick. If I come to the hospital to visit you, you will hear these words, I promise. 
Every time I pray for the sick, I use what Paul says. He says, Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him. That's what I pray for. God, have mercy. Show your mercy to the sick and to the weak and to those who need your touch. God can do it in a dramatic way, in a moment, like He does here and and as He will do in the next scene in the story, or He can do it in a most simple, private way that's unseen. It may be quick or it may be slow. My friends, God is just as responsible for the slow healings as He is the instantaneous one. God doesn't always heal us, but my friends, if there is healing, trust me, God's behind it somewhere. He is the God who heals our diseases. So what does that mean? It means, if I can say it this way, it means trust God and take your prevacid. Take the medicine. If God is, is, is you, He may use that to bring about that healing. Can God remove our personal sicknesses in a moment, in an instant? Yes, He most definitely can. Does He always do it? No. Many scholars think Paul's thorn in the flesh was a physical illness. We don't know that for sure, but assuming that it was, what does Paul say? He said, I prayed three times for God to take it away, and what did God do? He said, nope. Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness, and my grace is sufficient for you. And he says, I will sustain you and I will be with you even as you go through that. What do we do when God doesn't remove our illnesses and our sicknesses instantly? Well, first of all, we have to trust him. We have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And we have to rely upon him. Probably the sickest I've ever been was a number of years ago when uh, my gallbladder decided to have a mutiny against my other internal organs. And... um, you can ask my wife, true, like 2 o'clock in the morning, I was laying on the bathroom floor in the fetal position, out loud, quoting Romans 8.18. It was the only thing that kept me sane, that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And I did, I just over and over, I kept saying that. Okay, God, this suffering, as bad as this is, I I can't even imagine what you're going to do for us in the long run. There's a sense in which we do. We have to trust Him. Do we pray for those that are sick to be healed? Absolutely. Did you hear James 5 earlier? If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church to pray for them. And not just the elders, but the next verse says what? Pray for one another that you might be healed. We pray with hope. We pray with expectation that God would heal. You say, but I'm not a very good prayer warrior. Neither was Elijah. He had a nature just like ours. But God answered. God has ordained that prayer is the means often by which He brings about healing, sometimes slow, sometimes instant, and yet all coming from Him. We have a room full of people. Many of you, you've gotten reports from doctors and you've seen God grant healings. You've seen God do things slow, some, some fast, and yet ways in which you've watched and seen that, yes, Jesus cares and Jesus cures. Because no pain is too small and no person is too small. As a church, for a long time now, we've been praying for Anna Wilson. She's two. She's a pretty small person. And yet God has used the hand, the skillful hand of doctors and the wisdom to bring about her to be in a good place. Her most recent checkup was still clear. And we praise God for that. But no pain and no person is too small for His healing touch. Do you take the Wednesday night prayer sheet with all the sicknesses of people in our church? Do you take it and just read it and put it aside? Or do you pray for one another? Do you lift them up and to to make sure that, that you're interceding for them? Your prayer might be the means by which God accomplishes that healing. Because the prayers of a righteous man accomplishes much. So no pain, no person's too small. Then Mark teaches us, number two, that no affliction is too big. No affliction is too big for the Son's healing power. That's in verses 32 to 34. 
It's interesting, we have these two stories back to back because there's some big differences. One story's private, one story's public. One's an individual, the other is a crowd. The first story, we see basically the ease of Jesus' healing, and now we see the extent of Jesus' healing. In the first story, he just touched her hand and she's healed. And now we see the scope of his healing no matter what's brought to him. Look what it says in verse 32. When evening came after the sun had set. Now, scholars talk about that redundancy in Mark. Why would he say it both ways? I mean, you don't need to say it both ways. Evening assumes the sunset and the sunset assumes evening. Why would he say it that way? He says it that way, I think, because if you remember, what day is it? Sabbath. And in the first century, the Jewish day ended at sundown. So it's been Sabbath, and Sabbath is what? It's the day you don't work. It's the day that you rest. You don't do any labors. And it's as if they went to the synagogue, saw what Jesus did. They went home and saw their infirmed loved ones, their children who were sick, and their grandparents who were sick, and they waited for the sun to dip below the horizon because now they can labor, now they can work, and pick up their loved ones and go. And at that moment, as the sun goes down, it's no longer Sabbath. They're not breaking the law. And so it says they began bringing to him at that precise moment, as if they were waiting for this. All who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. The phrase, they began bringing, it really kind of implies they were bringing and bringing and bringing and bringing and bringing. It's this stream of continuous people with continuous problems. In fact, it says there, those who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. Once again, you find the, the physical disease that's going on and you find this spiritual possession that's going on and Jesus is going to, to address both of them. Verse 33, And the whole city had gathered at the door. Now, obviously, I think this is hyperbole. It's Mark's way of saying Jesus is the talk of the town. His name is trending in the news feed. Everybody's discussing this guy Jesus and what he did in the synagogue and now what he's doing over at Peter's house with all these sick people. And so verse 34 says, And he healed, notice, many who were ill with what? Various diseases and cast out many demons. He was not permitting them to speak because they knew who he was. Did did you see what Jesus heals here? How many people? Many people. What kinds of diseases? Various diseases. And what number of demons? Many demons. Mark just leaves it up to our imagination in a sense. As one commentator said, Jesus is not a specialist. He's the ultimate general practitioner. Doesn't matter what malady was brought to him. Doesn't matter what deformity he saw. Curved spine straightened. Deaf ears opened. Leprosy gone. You name it, at this moment, he could do it. It's like what Isaiah predicted, that when the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, and the lame, the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. It was healing upon healing upon healing upon healing as Jesus does this and casting out demons. It doesn't tell us how many demons. It just says many. Was it one? Was it two? Was it ten? Was it a thousand? There's no end to the scope, no end to the extent. There was none of these things that was too big where Jesus sat back and said, I'm sorry, I I don't have the power. That's one that I can't do. That's not one I can fix. No, He heals various diseases and casts out many diseases. Demons. I think it's interesting as we look at this, we find here, I use the word affliction. Because I think that's really what Mark is hinting at here. Because here you have what? Two kinds of affliction. You have physical affliction and you have spiritual affliction. And either way, these people are suffering with countless different diseases and with numerous demons. There's a sense in which this suffering is taking place all throughout Capernaum. These are all problems, both the spiritual problems of demon possession and the various diseases. These are all problems brought on by the fall. Rest assured, these conditions and maladies and possessions, they did not happen in Genesis 1 and 2. 
It wasn't until after the sin, the corruption of the world, that this, this kind of stuff begins to spiral out of control. And so Jesus comes and he sees their pain and their brokenness and their shame, and he comes and he restores it as a sampling of what he can do, and he takes that affliction and he removes it. And nothing is a match for his power. There's a movie a few years ago, some of you may have seen. It's a kid's movie, so a lot of you probably didn't see it. It was called Wreck-It Ralph. Remember, remember that movie? It's, it's this big hulking character, Ralph, who goes around destroying everything. And the protagonist, the good guy in the story, is this guy named Fix-It Felix. And, and Felix has this little magical, I think it's a golden hammer. And everywhere he goes, he taps on it and it fixes. Building falls, he taps on it and fixes. A ladder, a bush, a tree, doesn't matter. Even people, he taps on it and he fixes it. And his famous line in the movie, he says, it is my job to fix whatever Ralph wrecks. I think in a similar way, Mark here is reminding us that whatever sin wrecks, whatever the fall wrecks, whatever the devil wrecks, Jesus has the job, the ability, and the plan one day to fix it all. There is no affliction that is too big, too great. No suffering that is too great for Jesus' hand to one day fix. This is a keyhole glimpse into what He will do. Now we know that these people, many of them, they probably got sick again. They certainly all died. So this was not a permanent healing in that sense. These people no doubt got that way, but Jesus was showing them His power. He was showing them His ability. He was showing them a taste of what He would one day fully and forever do in His kingdom. This isn't just about Jesus fixing a, a handful of people. This is about humanity and its overall brokenness. No matter where that suffering shows up. He's not just fixing fevers and fungus. He's fixing the fall. He is restoring their bodies and our souls. And one day He will restore our world, everything to the way that it was supposed to be. And it's through His death and resurrection that He will bring about not only a a fixing of the soul, that, that our souls that have been separated from God can now be in a right relationship with Him, but that one day our aching bodies will be resurrected and will be made whole. And this perishable will put on imperishable. And because of his healing power, Jesus becomes popular. Now, we don't know if all these people came to Jesus for the right reasons. In fact, there may be some of you here today, you hear this and it appeals to you. You think, well, I I want some of that. I'd like to have my aches and pains gone. My friend, if that's the only reason you're coming to Jesus, you're missing the point. I learned a a new phrase this week. I'd never heard this. Uh, Those of you who've been missionaries, you might have heard this before. It was a phrase somebody used. He referred to uh, people in in the mission field. He referred to them as rice Christians. And his statement was people that they didn't actually come because of Christ. They came because the missionaries would give them something. There may be some in this crowd, there may be some here today, you hear this and think, boy, I I want Jesus to sort of fix all my problems and make me healthy. And and, and my friend, he may not do that but he, he in this life, but he will do it eternally. And it starts not with the outside, it starts with the inside. That he saves us and gives us a new heart and a new life in him. You see, in these miracles, Jesus is showing us what He can do and what one day He permanently will do. Jesus will see every ache and every pain and every fever and every demon and every wrinkle and every spot and He will remove every one forevermore. As John says in Revelation 21, God Himself will wipe away the tears from their eyes and there will no longer be any death There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain because the first things have passed away. Often He does do it in this life. But what He has done in this life is the down payment and guarantee and proof that He will most assuredly do it for us in the age to come. 
and we look in confidence to the Son who heals. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word about our Lord who indeed brings healing. We know, as Isaiah said, that by his stripes we are healed. We thank you that that healing no doubt takes place in our souls. It does take place in our hearts. We we are given a new heart, a heart of flesh and not one of stone. And that we are made new creatures in Christ. And Father, we do think of those in our midst today who are suffering and hurting and ill. And we know that you have the power to heal and so we pray for them. For those that are home, shut in, who can't get out. We pray, Father, that you will watch over them and be with them. And may we as a church be with them to encourage them. And Father, we pray that we would look unto Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the great and only healer who brings about the healing that only you can give. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.